Yes, we do. We do, thank you. Okay. And I apologize for the camera. I didn't realize how it's not clear. But meetings in the era of Zoom. All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rolando Bonilla. I am the chair of the San Jose Planning Commission. Welcome to the Planning Commission study session meeting. This meeting is being held via Zoom conference call due to the COVID-19 crisis. Members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. You may also view and listen to the meeting on live stream cable TV, Granicus, and YouTube. Following roll call during today's summary of hearing procedure, we will review how the public may provide comment during today's session. We will now take roll call. Bonilla here. Casey? Here. Caballero? Caballero? Cantrell? Here. Garcia? Garcia? I see Garcia. So he is here. Uh, Lardinois? Here. Montañez? Montañez? Oliverio? Oliverio? Ornelas Wise? Here. Torrance? Here. Young? Here. Great, let the record reflect that as of right now, Caballero, Montañez, and Oliverio are not present. Present, sorry. Thank you, Commissioner Oliverio is here. Let the record reflect that Commissioners Caballero and Montañez are not here at the moment. Summary of hearing procedures. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. City staff will call out names of the public who identified they want to speak. You may identify yourself by the raise hand feature on Zoom. Click star nine on your phone, or you may call 408 535-3505 or email planning support staff at sanjoseca.gov and identify your name, phone number, and what items you would like to speak on. As your name is called, city staff will unmute you to speak. After we confirm your audio is working, your allotted time will begin. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Staff will unmute the speaker to respond to the commissioner. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. The planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions and discuss the item. So before I hand this meeting off to uh, Robert Manford, I'd like to also just give my colleagues a heads up that uh, commissioner Vice Chair Kesey will be chairing the second half of the, the meeting as I have a familial obligation to tend to. So uh, I hope the second half, uh, let's have fun in the first half so I don't miss out in the second half, okay? <laughs> so with that, let me now uh, hand this over to Mr. Robert Manford. The floor is yours, Robert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Robert Manford. I'm Deputy Director for Planning. We have a very exciting afternoon uh, with insightful presentation from staff from various uh, sister departments and their uh, development services. Uh, so uh, I will start off by uh, asking Ms. Nancy uh, Klein from uh, Office of Economic Development to introduce herself and her staff. Robert, this is Nancy. Thank you very much. You caught me slightly by surprise, only because I think our time is slotted for 2.45. Um, I'm uh, going to take a little time at 2.45 just to, to reintroduce you uh, to the Office of Economic Development. I, I am the director, and we have several sections and I don't know that everybody on the Planning Commission has been introduced to the different divisions and would really like to um, share that with you and hopefully be in contact with you on the items of interest to you over time. And Nathan Donato Weinstein, who at the moment is working at the 
uh, flea market for the vendors who will be back at his his desk in time to present with me uh, for our item. But thank you very, very much for including us today. Thank you, Nancy. And I believe when the time arrives for presentation, the other members of your staff will be introduced. Uh, in addition to key members of the planning staff that I will introduce later, I would like to start with our city attorney, who everybody knows, but Vera, if you could please provide a quick introduction, then we'll move on to planning staff. Hi, my name is Vera Todorov, and uh, I'm a senior deputy city attorney. I have been with the city for 19 years. Um, this will be my, gosh, 35th year, I think, in municipal law. I have worked for two other cities, the city of Salinas and the city of Oceanside prior to this and worked for other government agencies before that. But it's definitely it's about 35 years uh, working with cities and working with planning commissions, working with uh, housing issues, um, labor and employment law, you name it. And, and so but primarily for San Jose, it has been land use and development for that 19 years. And I've represented the planning commission now for. I'm trying to think of how long it's been at least seven or eight years now um, and and full time and and used to trade off with another person before that. So um, I really appreciate working with the new 11 member planning commission. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that's a lot of people and a lot of different thoughts and opinions, which is wonderful. And so um, and I, I will tell you more to answer the questions that you gave. Uh, us at previous meetings about what you wanted to discuss at this um retreat and so we'll deal with that with items numbers three and four thank you very much thank you very much vera we'll now move on to mr michael brio who is one of two deputy directors including myself michael michael you are muted Yeah, hi, I'm Michael Brio, uh, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. I'm Robert's counterpart in planning. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. You're more like my partner in crime. <laughs> That's correct. So uh, we also do we have, have the same attorney, Robert. <laughs> we also do have our division managers here. We'll start with Sylvia Doe. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Sylvia Doe. Like Robert mentioned, I'm one of the planning division managers. Um, I've been with the city's planning division for about 15 years. Um, I started off doing specific planning and then worked my way around to public information in the permit center, then working on ordinance and policy amendments. And then more recently, for a few years now, I've been working on development review. So much of the uh, Entitlement development permits, use permits that go before your team um, comes from one of my uh, one of the planning divisions development review teams. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sylvia. We'll now go to Mr. Tim Rood. Tim. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Tim Rood. I'm the other division manager in planning development review. Great, thanks, Tim. Now we'll go to our principal planners, Mr. David Keon. Good afternoon, Commissioners. David Keon, Principal Planner on the City's Environmental Review Team. I've been with the City for just over nine years now, but I've also worked in other jurisdictions, um, including Santa Cruz County. And yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, David. And uh, we also have uh, Dana, who is our HPO. Dana Peak. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dana Peak. And I'm the Historic Preservation Officer for the city. I staff the Historic Preservation Commission. And um, I'm here for you for, <clears throat> pardon me, all things historic. Uh, I have a master's degree from uh, Cornell University uh, in Historic Preservation Planning. And I was the Historic Preservation Program man Manager for the County of Santa Clara for 10 years. And um, I used to work with Commissioner Ornalis a long time ago. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been with the city almost two years in January and, um, that's my story. Nice to meet you. Hi, Dana. Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. And, uh, I must say, we also have one acting, uh, division manager. Her name is Martina Davis, who is working on Michael's team. She may not have had the chance to join us because she may be busy doing something else. But the last but not the least is 
Mr. Chris Burton, who is our director, the director of planning, building, and code enforcement, is here with us and will share a few remarks. Chris, the ball is in your court. Thanks, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to get the opportunity to spend some time together. Um, as Robert said, my name is Chris Burton. Uh, I was, well, it's not that recent anymore, but uh, it's been about four months almost to the day. Uh, I was appointed as Director of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement by uh, former city manager, Dave Sykes, um, and the city council. So, um, so yeah, so I really appreciate the opportunity to get to spend some time with you uh, today. I've, I've been tracking Planning Commission closely over the last four months, but I know we've not had the opportunity to really interact as much as I'd have, have liked to. Um, so so I'm, I'm glad we have this, this opportunity to kind of reset that. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to chat through a few things. I'm happy to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I want to tell you about kind of where we're at right now as the department, so you have some insight into that. Um, talk a little bit about kind of our working relationship um, and, and sort of how we, you know, collaborate together to get all this good work done. Um, and then also just point to a couple of the big things on the horizon, because I think there's some important things coming to the Planning Commission uh, over the next few months. I just want to sort of put a highlight on it, um, and, and so you have that visibility as well. So who am I? Um, so uh, I've been with the city for about 15 years now. I joined in 2006. Um, I'd moved to the US from the UK. That's where I get the accent from. Um, and I would actually, uh, I'd, I'd done my degree at the University of Westminster in London in uh, what's a course that's called Human Geography, but it's ultimately a course around sort of urban studies and the interaction between people and the places they inhabit. Um, and I, you know, fell out of college and got a, a job in tech. I was actually working for a small startup um, that spanned a couple of different countries. And for that and a couple of other reasons, I ended up uh, in, in the, the region, in the Bay Area. Um, and then in about uh, two early 2006, I was looking at other opportunities and saw uh, there was a job at the city for a, a planner in the planning department. Thought, well, you know, that, that's kind of related to my degree. I think I can do something with that. Um, so went along, did, did a test. Um, we used to test really extensively. We still do some testing, but I sat in a conference room with a plan set and a general plan and the zoning code. And, had to figure out what the response would be to a development application. Um, you know, had some good conversations with some people and was really fortunate to be offered a position with the department, um, which was a little odd because I didn't have experience with California land use requirements or CEQA or anything like that. So I had a very, very steep learning curve very early on in my career. Um, but I was a development review planner for about two and a half years. Um, so I worked on a whole variety of projects um, throughout the city. Um, back then, we were organized by district. Um, and so initially, I was working in District 2 and District 4. And then actually, there was a, a shift. And we started to get oriented by project type. Um, so I was an industrial planner because I'd spent so much time working in North San Jose and Edendale. So I worked on projects like the America Center up on 237, um, the first project in North San Jose, a couple of the big uh, residential projects that came through the North San Jose area development policy. Um, and then a lot of sort of smaller projects with machine shops and courtyards and, and uh, actually did a lot of trash for a while. I worked on recycling facilities and, and things like that. So in late 2008, um, an opportunity became available in the city manager's office, actually working for Nancy in the Office of Economic Development. Uh, and I was really fortunate to be able to, to take that opportunity and move upstairs um to the 17th floor and work in oed um around that same time obviously we all know what was going on in 2008 as far as the great recession is concerned but within city hall and i'm not sure how sort of aware folks are that but there was a, a massive upheaval um that really really impacted pbc as a department um we lost a lot of really good long-standing staff members, a lot of institutional knowledge as a result of the recession um, deep into 2009. And I think, you know, we're still recovering from some aspect of that uh, in a number of different ways. Yeah. Um, but so I was really fortunate. I got the opportunity with Nancy in OED. I spent the next 12 years in OED, um, really focused around small business, uh, not small business, around business outreach, um, development facilitation, uh, you know, the opportunity to work on some of the big development policies and, and projects. 
um, and sort of really developed an interest in some key areas, um, but, but policy being one of the major ones. And so uh, for the last six or seven years, I was actually the lead for what's called the, the CDCSA. It's the internal working group between departments uh, within the city, within community and economic development. And so spent a lot of time on interdepartmental coordination, uh, a lot of time on some big policy initiatives as well. Um, and then through the pandemic, um, the business model for economic development, as Nancy, I'm sure, going to tell you, changed almost overnight. So we went from working with big corporations to really needing to deliver service to small businesses in a time of crisis. Um, and so I was at the kind of forefront of a lot of that work on, uh, on the small business response through the EOC. Um, and then, as I said, in June, I got a new job uh, coming back to PBCE. And it's, it's really a return. It's great to sort of be back and come back into an organization that I started off my career with the city as. Um, but it's very different work. Um, just in, in 15 short years, the work has changed significantly. I think the context around land use and planning has shifted significantly as well. Um, you know, when I think back to where we were in 2006 and our approach to planning, um, the focus of the city uh, under the old sort of general plan, the, the Horizon 2020, um, was very different. Um, you know, we went through the Great Recession. We've gone through, you know, the longest economic expansion uh, on, on record. Um, and then we've hit this major pandemic. And in the background, we've got the context of changes to state law that have completely upended the way we look at certain projects, especially housing. Um, and, and so it's changed the context completely. I think the other thing that's really important to be aware of is that in the last 18 months, as a result of the pandemic, we've had to shift our business model significantly as well. Um, the entire service delivery model for not just planning, but building all of the development services partners was based on an in-person service delivery model, right? We, we met people at the counter. We had meetings with developers, with applicants, with the community where we could sit down, we could talk about the issues that they were seeing, they were concerned with. Um, and we had to transition that overnight to an online model, uh, to a digital service delivery model. Um, but we still based that very much on how we used to do business, which is kind of, it's a little sort of reliant on the in-person. Um, and that's, that's definitely created challenges, right? And I think we've seen that. Um, I think where we're at right now as a department is, is you know, still trying to adjust to some of that shift. Um, even though we've reopened some in-person services, City Hall is now open. Uh, we have, you know, aspects of the permit center open for in-person service. The bulk of our work is still occurring in the digital environment. Um, and that's creating pressures, right? So just to kind of highlight the difference, the conversations that would happen in the office between colleagues, in a conference room between you know, planners and developers, uh, in community meetings with the community, now all largely occur over email. So email volume has gone through the roof. Um, and that's creating problems with responsiveness and how we keep up and how we track and how we keep moving projects forward. So, you know, we're, we're still working through some of those challenges. I think the other really important context to understand for us as a department right now is that, um, you know, the last 18 months have, have left a lot of people reflecting on their decisions around work, on where they work and how they work and who they work for. Um, and so, you know, we, we've lost some key staff. Um, certainly in the last six months, we've, we've really seen uh, some challenges around that. And I think the other part of it is it's really hard to hire people right now. And that's not a PBCE issue. It's not a planning issue. That's an organization and a, a regional wide issue. So, um, so that's really kind of where my work is focused at the moment as the director of the department is focusing on how do we build a, a long-term vision for sustainability so we can continue to deliver service to the residents and businesses throughout the city. Um, so a, a lot of my work is sort of inward focused right now. That's not to say that, you know, I'm not tracking every single project and, and all of the big policy issues that are coming through the city. Um, they're all of critical importance. I'm just incredibly fortunate to have Michael and Robert and the team who are, you know, absolutely technical expert, experts in their field um, and really carry the weight on that while we continue this process of sort of stabilizing and, and rebuilding as an organization. Um, so, so that kind of gets me to, to sort of 
where, where are we, right, and, and our relationship. And I want to assure you that absolutely, you know, you have access to me directly um, over the next sort of few weeks, next couple of months, I'll be looking for opportunities to reach out, connect, um, and maybe have some more of those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So you have more direct access to me, but I also want to, you know, foster that opportunity for collaboration with our staff. So, you know, I know you all connect really well with, with Robert and the team, but, you know, to the extent that questions come up, to the extent that you're seeing projects, to the extent you have concerns, you know, I'm a resource, Robert and Michael are a resource, and certainly all of our division managers and principal planners are there to support you and answer your questions. We want to make sure that you have the, the same level and depth of understanding uh, and the same sort of amount of information accessible to you as you're making decisions. It's a, a critical of critical importance that we have that really strong partnership between us as a department and you as the planning commission. Um, you're an extension of our ability to have the conversation with the community, right? To listen to their concerns, to review projects, and then make appropriate uh, decisions within the context of the plans that the city has laid out. Um, so, so it's of incredible importance to me that we have that really good working relationship. Um, that's what I hope to continue to foster a little bit more, and we'll look for more opportunities like this to, to have that conversation. Um, so with that, um, let me touch on uh, a couple of things. One, sort of just on the, the upcoming kind of view of the world, um, I just wanted to highlight you know, the next couple of months, um, you'll be seeing uh, at least three items through Planning Commission um, that are of particular importance related to the general plan. Um, so starting on October 27th, you'll see uh, the conversation around Coyote Valley, so less than a week away. Um, following that on, on November 10th, you'll see the bulk of the update coming through as, the, as part of the four-year review. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that to the extent we need to, but the way that we set up our general plan in 2011 was to do annual reviews on the small things, but really do a major review on a four-year cycle. Uh, and we're really coming to the end of the second four-year review. Um, and then the last piece coming through in December will be the conversation around opportunity housing. Um, I just wanna sort of, make a note that um, on next week, on Thursday, on the 28th of October, uh, we're going to be having a study session with the City Council. Uh, certainly would encourage you all to pay attention to that if you have the opportunity. Um, and that'll really be focused on SB9 and SB10, which is this, the, the recently signed legislation that allows additional housing in uh, traditionally single family areas. Um, that, that's going to be a big topic for us on sort of how we deal with implementation, but it has significant bearing on the kind of future of our work around opportunity housing. So, um, so that will sort of play into that December conversation. It's an important precursor. Um, we actually released a, an info memo just explaining what the bills do um, last week. Um, uh, if you don't get the sort of regular emails on uh, coming out from the city that give you all the sort of information memos, let us know and we'll follow up. And provide that information as well. And so with that, I think I'm going to hand it back to Robert just finally to say uh, a big thank you to all of you uh, for your service, for your commitment to the City of San Jose, uh, for really taking the time to dig in on these really important issues. Um, we appreciate you and, and we look, look forward to continuing to work with you all uh, over, over these fun coming projects that we have. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. That was very insightful. And uh, we'll now move on to our own very able city attorney, uh, Vera, to provide us a presentation on uh, the conduct of public meetings and hearings, including the rules of order. So Vera. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for, there we go. My document opened up, there we go. Um, and we're, the first item has to do with uh, the conduct of public meetings and hearings. And there were questions from the commission about uh, the rules of order that apply. At the last commission meeting, uh, you approved a change from Robert's rules of order to Rosenberg's rules of order, which are much easier to understand. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs> I'm sure staff is as well. And the chair probably is too, um, although I haven't spoken to him about it. So I may be, I may be speaking out of turn. Um, both um, items number three and four on your agenda today, there is one thing to always remember when we speak about public hearings, when we uh, speak about who we talk to about items coming before the Planning Commission, there are overarching rules having to do with fairness, 
and due process for applicants and the public coming before the commission. So when we talk about all of these different rules that apply, due process is the primary concern of the planning commission when it hears items where it needs to make findings in particular. And so when we talk about the conduct of public meetings and hearings, due process is the primary concern. That is also a primary concern in your communications with applicants and with members of the public. Um, so to begin, um, the purview of the Planning Commission, this is the first item on the handout that is up on the screen right now. The purview of the Planning Commission is specified in City Charter Section 1000. The Planning Commission is one of three charter commissions um, that, that make findings and actually can adjudicate and make decisions having to do with people's property interests and the like. City Charter Section 1000 primarily gives the Planning Commission the power to make recommendations to the Council. Those recommendations on plans for future development of the city, like the general plan, specific plans, and area development policies. Also on land use and development regulations of the city, zoning and subdivision ordinance changes, for example, and on capital improvement programs. You um, always have the presentation annually for the adoption of the capital improvement program, and you um, make a recommendation to the council on that. There are also other powers and functions that are expressly given by the city council um, pursuant to the charter, to charter authority given to the council. And primarily those are in Title 20 um, for the Planning Commission. They're also in Title 18, which has to do with our um, CEQA compliance. It has to do with annexations into the city, changes in organization, but all, and also Title 19, which is the subdivision ordinance. But primarily in Title 20, and Title 20 grants to the Planning Commission final authority over conditional use permit, uh, over conditional use permits as a hearing body. Obviously, those permits can be appealed to the uh, City Council, but the Planning Commission has the authority to issue those permits um, and make findings in order to issue those permits. The Planning Commission is also the appellate hearing body for director's permit decisions. And in those, if appealed, the planning decision, the planning commission's decision is final. It is not appealable any further. Uh, the next court recourse on both of those would be to go to court um, and challenge. Um, there's also San Jose Municipal Code um, Chapter 2.08. Uh, chapter 2 has, has um, provisions dealing with every commission. I'm only going to skirt over that and mention it because there really are no substantive provisions that really uh, that are very important in that code section. The primary one is that um, the city council reduced the voting requirement for most of the planning commission's decisions from a majority of the a majority of the entire commission, meaning a majority of the eleven members or six, to a majority of those members who are present, so long as there is a quorum present. And that was because sometimes we had trouble getting um, enough people to vote on certain items. It's happened a few times in the last several years. The only exception to that is general plan amendments. General plan amendments require a vote of six. That is reflected in the commission's bylaws as well. So the bylaws are accurate in that regard. Um, with regard to, and I'm on, I'm on number 1C right now, with regard to uh, the planning commission's duties, you will see in policies that we discuss in item four, for example, that the planning commission is expected to be informed by reading um, all the materials that are given to you, listening to um, the hearing, all the parties that speak at the hearing, staff the applicant, any public comment, and you're to make independent land use recommendations meaning that you're not to be influenced, for example, by the council, by any other city commission, by anyone else. You make independent decisions based upon what you think is best for the city. You have also a relationship to various public bodies, but you're different. There are only two other commissions like you, civil service and the appeals hearing board that make findings and actually can make final decisions. The city council is the policymaker for the city. The planning commission does not make policy. 
What the planning commission does is make recommendations to the council on policy that is brought before you, like changes to the general plan, like specific plans, like area development policies, and like zoning ordinance changes. So those are legislative acts that can only be made by the city council and the planning commission makes recommendations. With regard to other commissions, they are th those commissions really only have recommendation authority and they are creatures of the city council, uh, city council's creation. The planning commission and the two other commissions I mentioned are unique in that they are formed by the city charter. Planning commission is also required by state law, by the land use and planning law. And the planning commission has what's called an adjudicatory function. So granted, you can't legislate, you don't make laws. But what you do is you have permit hearings where you are required to make findings based upon the evidence in the record in order to support your decision. So when you have, for example, a conditional use permit before you or other type of permit, you're required to make the findings that the city council has specified and adopted in the city code for the issuance of that particular permit. And you'll find that that is listed in every single staff report that you get. The staff goes through all the findings that are necessary to make under the zoning code for that type of permit. If they require another type of a determination under a council policy or something else, then they go through all of those findings that are required and they'll tell you what the finding requires and what staff's opinion is, whether that finding can be made or not. And you independently need to review that and determine if you agree with that or not. And if you don't agree with it, then you're required to make findings that support why you don't agree. And so um, whatever of those actions that you take on permits, you are required to make findings one way or the other. Um, with regard to protocols, which is section two here, there is a due process and fair hearing requirement, like I mentioned previously, that overarches everything that you do. You're required to be objective. That doesn't mean that you walk into a hearing without any opinion whatsoever. That would be impossible. We all have opinions about things. However, that means that you don't walk into a hearing with any kind of a bias or, a, or unable to listen to what people are, are telling you at the hearing, the evidence that they're bringing before you, the testimony that they're giving you. That applies to staff, the applicants, and the public. And so you have to listen to that and, and allow it to influence your decision and, and make that a part of your decision-making process. So in that regard, you're required to be impartial because you're required to listen to all of the evidence and testimony before you. Um, there also judicial decorum is required, which basically means that, you know, you, you conduct yourself in a manner that, is, that, that provides a fair hearing. Um, also, there are disclosures required, and as you, you have all been very, very good um, about being concerned about conflicts of interest and disclosing those on the record when you have them. The other type of disclosures that are also required is when something is going to be on a planning commission agenda, is on a planning commission agenda, and you have spoken to someone and gained information about that item outside of the hearing process, then you are required to disclose that at the time that this item is called. Uh, the item is called um, to be heard at the planning commission meeting, and you need to say who you spoke to, and you need to also say um, what the nature of the conversation and the information that you received was. Or if you went to go do a site visit, disclose that, whatever it is that you, know, that you need to disclose um, and, and have everybody share in the information that you received on that project. Um, I'm not gonna go through the substance and perception and discussion occurs to the chair. I think we've already done that. Um, and with regard to the hearings, you already know the order. The staff report is given. Then there is public testimony, which includes the applicant first and last. Then we close the public hearing and, you, and the, count, the commission deliberates. Someone makes a motion um, and there is a roll call vote. And roll call votes are required on these items by state law. Um, you cannot do A's or nays. And they also have to be either recorded on the recording of the hearing and the minutes of the hearing. 
So when we're tape recording the hearing, either video or audio, the vote needs to be recorded there um, verbally and the chair needs to say who voted how. So they can say, say um, the motion passes with these commissioners um, against or whatever, and but they need to hear your vote on the record. The other way of accomplishing that also, which when it's working most of the time is by having the vote shown on screen electronically. And we have done that as well. And, and that happens regularly as well. And um, I, at this point, I'm concluding um, item number three. Uh, excuse me, we're gonna go on to Robert, excuse me, Robert's rules of order, Rosenberg's rules of order. I'm sorry, let me pull that up. Did anybody have any questions about what I just spoke about? Having, having heard no one, <laughs> or did I hear anybody? Okay, I'm not hearing anyone. So um, I'm going to the very first, this is the one with the caricature of Dave Rosenberg, Judge Rosenberg on the front page. And I am not going to go through, this is a very, very good summary of Rosenberg's rules of order. And the summary, in fact, also basically uh, talks about simplifying what were Robert's rules of order and, and modernizing them. Um, I have to tell you that I'm not a big fan of, Rob, of Robert's rules myself because it's pretty lengthy and a very complicated handbook. And I've actually been in hearings with the city clerk with the uh, Civil Service Commission when I represented them formerly. And we had issues come up that were parliamentary and we took a break and literally took 20, 30 minutes looking through Robert's rules, couldn't really find the answer. And then when we finally did, we couldn't understand what was being asked to do. And that's happened a couple of times. That problem doesn't appear in Rosenberg's rules. It's not as complicated and difficult to use. So I'm glad we made the change. Now, there are a number of um, items on the first and second page, which talk about you know, the chair's role. I'm not going to get into that. They talk about establishing a quorum. We know about the quorum. Um, it is always six members of this commission because it's an 11 member body. And uh, the six members um, are the only, you have to have a quorum to legally transact business. Our bylaws go into a few exceptions to that. For example, adjourning a meeting when there isn't a quorum is one of them that those types of exceptions, our bylaws deal with them, but generally that is the rule. I'm gonna go on to the, uh, let me see. The agenda format on page two, we have been following, which is, as I said previously, is basically staff gives you, the chair announces the agenda item, clearly state what the subject is. And then the format is that the staff gives its report then we allow the public, including the applicant to speak. Applicant usually goes first for five minutes. We usually do two minutes for every, every other member of the public and then allow five minute rebuttal period for the applicant. After that, you know, the commission could ask the public and the applicant any questions that it desires to ask. Staff may ask, answer any questions that come up uh, during public comment. And after that, the chair closes the public hearing and the commission begins deliberation um, with, a, with a motion, potentially a motion as well during that period, and then a vote on the motion. And as I said, it needs to be a voice vote, a roll call vote. It cannot just be eyes and eyes, the raised hand vote. And so moving on to the third page, which I think is the, um, is of most interest uh, to the commissioners asking these questions are the motions in general. And what they, what they require, and I'm gonna to get to the three basic motions because you all have been making motions now for, for a while. And so you know that you just say, I move X, Y, and Z, and we get it. And then we have a second, if there's a second. And the chair recognizes the people making the motions. The three basic motions under Rosenberg's rules are, the basic motion, which is the one that puts forward a decision for the body's consideration, such as I move that the commission adopt this, approve the staff recommendation for project and then whatever the file number is. 
Um, that would be an example of that. And then someone seconds that motion. There may be, and this has happened at council quite a bit on items that I've had before council. The second type of motion is a motion to amend. So for example, the let's look at the first motion. I move to accept the to adopt the staff recommendation to approve the staff uh, recommendation on file number whatever it is. And then someone makes a motion to amend saying, I would like I move that we amend the motion to include a condition that says whatever the amendment is, right? And then that motion would be seconded, the motion to amend. That would be, that motion would then be, the motion to amend would be taken first. And what we've done often also is that we have basically, um, it, the motion to amend modifies the motion that's on the floor. There's also a third type of motion, which is a substitute motion, which completely ignores the original motion as far as substance and wants to do something else. For example, the original, the basic motion is, I move to approve this project as recommended by staff. The substitute motion is, I move to deny the project, or, you know, and that could be a substitute motion. What happens then is if there are multiple motions before the body, Rosenberg's rules suggests that no more than three motions be heard at the same time. And when you get down to multiple motions before the body, it basically says that the last motion is heard first. So if you have, for example, two motions before the body, a motion to amend, and then you have the basic original motion, the motion to amend is heard first and voted on first and commented on first. If that motion succeeds, it supersedes the original motion. If it does not su su uh, succeed, if it does not get affirmative votes, then you go back to the original motion, the basic motion, and that's the one that, that is decided upon. And so, um, that would be the order of business. Does anybody have any questions about that? One thing that I also want to mention, and I'm looking for where this is on the page, is if there is a tie vote of the commission, say there are members absent, or there is a tie vote, generally that tie vote um, is a denial of the, of, of the um, project it will not be approved, it will be denied because you need affirmative votes to take action. And so it results in a denial. We do have a section in the bylaws that deals with that, that says if the denial is due, that if, if the tie vote is due to an absence of a member, not an abstention, but an absence of a member from a meeting, we will continue the item to the next meeting for when that member can show up and vote. Because the reason is, you have um, property owners, developers, and others who have gone through a development process for often several years, a year, two years, three years, sometimes even longer on a major project. And they expect a decision, be it yay or nay, based upon the merits of the project. They expect to have the findings made to support or deny the project. And when there aren't enough commissioners there to make that decision, or when there are is a tie vote, which could be remedied by other commissioners appearing at the hearing, we uh, will continue that item. And that has been added to the bylaws. We had an issue with um, one project a few years ago where we had both abstentions and absences. And um, so we came up with this rule to take care of it. And so let me see. Or anything else that we wanted to talk about here. Yeah, I'm on page um, four right now, which is to debate or not to debate. Obviously, motions on that have to do with permits or recommendations are debatable. That is something where we take where we take you know, public comment, that's something where the commissioners discuss it on the dais, their opinions about how, how they wanna vote, their concerns, whatever it is. 
but there are certain items that are not debatable. For example, a motion to adjourn um, is not really, you know, requires a simple majority vote, but doesn't really need to have debate and the chair doesn't need to call for debate. Um, same with a motion to recess. Um, the chair determines the length of the recess. Um, a motion to fix a time to adjourn. So for example, and that requires, a, you know, and the commission has done this previously where uh, previously they had a practice of not adjourning, of adjourning at 11 o'clock as a standard. And if they wanted to go past 11 o'clock PM, then they would need a motion from a member of the body to um, continue the meeting. And then they, you know, uh, after 11 PM, and they would often do that when they were close to finishing. Um, within an hour of finishing or so. Otherwise, they would continue the meeting to the following hearing date. And so these are examples of motions that do not require debate. The chair can just take them as they are. Let me give you a bit of a break. It seems like Commissioner Oliverio has a question. Is that correct, Commissioner Oliverio? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Vera, on yeah. abstention, what, uh, so city council members cannot abstain. Explain to me how, when uh, commissioners can abstain or not abstain. Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. There is a council policy that basically discourages abstention just because you don't want to vote. Um, or be, you know, um, abstention is however required when you have a conflict of interest or when you believe that you are biased um, on a project or, uh, or against someone coming before you or against just a particular concept in general, your feelings are so strong that you don't feel that you can hear the matter fairly. And I will give you an example of that. And I may have given you an example um, that I used to give the Civil Service Commission. And the Civil Service Commission is charged with the discipline of public employees working for the city. And they're charged at hearing appeals of discipline that's been rendered. And what I tell the commission is sometimes you don't even know, you don't even know that you have that bias until someone shows up and you recognize them or something happens that triggers you. And the example that I give them is, um, for example, let's say several years ago, you had a police officer pull you over and you thought the circumstances were not legitimate for that officer pulling you over. He acted very rudely toward you um, you felt that they treated you very, very unfairly. And so you don't know the name of the officer or you don't remember it. And all of a sudden you have a hearing on discipline of a police officer and there's that darn guy who gave you the ticket several years ago who you thought was a major jerk. And you recognize that you're gonna have a hard time separating your experience that you had with that person from what you, from the hearing itself on the discipline, particularly if the charges were that he was dealing with other people like a jerk or uncalled for stops, that kind of a thing. So the appropriate thing to do there is to abstain. And that's, that is an example of bias. Um, and I'll give you other examples uh, in our following talk in item number four. But there, are, there may be times that you feel so strongly about something that you don't feel that you can be an impartial decision maker. And so that also would require abstention. So it's conflict of interest and bias, which is a form of conflict of interest. The city council rules, um, and I'm sorry, I can't quote which rule it is. It's probably 0-4, but it could be another one. Um, require you to vote um, if you're at the hearing you vote, you just can't say, I really don't feel like making a decision in this matter. The reason that you're on the commission and that you've been appointed is to make a decision, is to assist in making a decision and state your opinion um, if you have one and, and vote. And um, it is not to just listen and kind of go, oh, you know, I don't really know what I want to do. And so I'm not going to make a decision or I don't want to, you know, get any flack for voting a certain way and I don't want to make a decision. And so very clearly, you do need to vote unless you have a conflict of interest, including bias, um, including but not limited to bias. Um, and so um, that is the direction from council as far as your role. Does that answer the question, Commissioner Oliverio? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Torrance. <laughs> 
Thank you, Chair and Robert. Um, and I just don't have a question. I just have a comment. I just want to say thank you, Vera, for walking us through this. Um, it's I think the reason I don't have any questions is you were very clear and the examples also really speak to me. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Well, thank you. And the only one, only other thing I'm gonna mention having to do with this, because I think that you're all very courteous and that you know you understand the decorum of being a planning commissioner and giving people an opportunity to speak and hearing them. And I've seen that in your conduct. And so I'm not gonna get into the, the last part of this, but I really do encourage you to read this several pages because they really are excellent as far as you know really talking about the practical matters of a commission hearing the only place where it's inaccurate is when it talks about doing you know the a nay vote you you're required to do a roll call and that's the place where it's inaccurate as far as the law but that applies to this type of a hearing body that may be accurate for other bodies but not for this one um, the other thing is um, a motion to reconsider which is on page let me see here it's on page six or seven, six of seven, excuse me. This is an unusual motion that I that has been used a couple of times. I want to say two or three times on items that I've had that went before the council. I've never seen it used by the commission. But for example, I'll give you a recent example. Um, we had um, we had a hearing where uh, there was there was going to be information that was provided by an applicant. And the commission, the council did not, I believe it was that they did not continue the meeting in order to do that. They forgot to. And this was a really lengthy hearing where there were tons of amendments to the original motion being made. The clerk and I were like barely keeping up with what did this person say that they wanted, you know, very complicated, went late at night. And then, and then uh, when it was reheard, there was more discussion, and then it was it was continued to another hearing date, more discussion, and they discovered that they did not put down a date certain by which they had to come back, uh, you know, by which the continued hearing was going to be, and they needed a date certain. So later in the meeting, one of the council members said, "We need to go back to this item. I want to do a motion to reconsider." because we need to have a time certain or a date certain to come back, you know, to have this hearing continued to. And everybody went, oh yeah, you're right. And so they got a second to that motion and did it. Now, what happened was you have to have um, the, it can only be made by a member who voted in the majority on the original motion. And it has to, um, the, the member also has to agree, the member who made the original motion has to agree to bring the item back and have it reconsidered. In these cases, that, that did happen because they were mistakes that occurred. And so um, this is always something that you can do if we forget something or there's a mistake or whatever. It's never happened in the years that I've been uh, dealing with the Planning Commission, but if we discover that that happens, it may be that someone says, we need to do a motion to reconsider to fix something. It has to happen at the same meeting. And so just so that you know, that could happen. It probably never will, but it could. And so um, with that, let me move on to the second, um, I, the second uh, handout here, which is a cheat sheet on Ro Rosenberg's Rules of Order. I am not going to get to the third document that we have on Rosenberg's Rules of Order because you already received that when you did your new commissioner training. All of you received that. It's longer, it's a publication by the League of California Cities, but I wanted to remind you that it's another resource so that you can have it in your back pocket. Now, the rules of order cheat sheet goes through, you know, the motions to adjourn, recessing, you know, a point of privilege, like complaining about noise in the room, all of these, and it, it says whether or not it, whether or not you can interrupt the speaker, whether you interrupt the speaker to make the motion, which motions take precedence over others. And it also talks about where a second is needed, for example, a point of privilege doesn't need a second. Um, it talks about who decides whether it requires a vote of the commission, whether it's a super majority vote or whether the chair can decide and whether the, or not the motion can be amended. So for example, a motion to adjourn doesn't get amended. For example, a complaint about noise doesn't get amended. Um, you know, tabling a motion doesn't get amended. 
that kind of thing. But I wanted to alert you to this and just tell you that this is something that I'm going to be referring to um, when we when we're working um, when we're doing our work as the planning commission. And um, this is also something that you can do. It's probably a little bit more formal than, than what we normally do. Like if someone wants to complain about noise, I don't think any of you are going to say points of privilege. You're probably going to say, uh, Chair, Chair Bonilla, uh, it's really noisy and I can't hear. Can we please get the crowd to quiet down? Indeed. You know, something like that, right? <laughs> so, you know, it might be points of privilege <laughs> or whatever, but, you know, it, it's a... Uh, it, but the other ones, I think, make a little bit more sense. But the, you're not always going to be making motions with exactly this language, and we get it. We're practical. And remember that the bylaws say that these are um, guides that we try to follow, but they are not um, – we don't have to follow them entirely strictly. And the reason it says that is that instances come up where due process and common sense require us to do certain things that may not be addressed in any of these rules of order. And so that would be that would be the most common. You know, it, it, sometimes you just make a you have to you have to make a call. And I advise that way. And so um with that, I think we're done with item three and I'm probably way over time wise. And so hopefully did anybody have any other questions? There yeah. Hi, this is Sylvia. I um, I did have a question. I know you said that. So if someone makes a motion to move something to adopt it, but then you, say you have a different opinion and you want to move to amend it and maybe modify it mm -hmm. an existing condition, so then you someone else can do that, right? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And that motion would require a second as well. It's no, you know, as far as the protocol, it's no different than the than the original motion, the basic motion. Yeah, and you know that happens at council meetings all the time, for example. And sometimes what happens is the maker of the motion, and and we don't do this formally sometimes. And you'll hear me do this too, even though I'm not a commissioner. I'll hear the basic motion. The commissioner says, let's adopt the staff recommendation, but the staff made certain tweaks to their recommendation at the meeting. They put them in the record verbally, and you'll hear me say, can we clarify, does that include X, Y, and Z? And they say yes. And is that okay with the second or the motion? Yes, and we move on. That's not a formal amendment. I'm just clarifying the motion. And other commissioners can do that as well. The council does that too sometimes, and they're saying, does that include this? And the, the, the maker of the motion says yes, and we clarify it among the group. So. You know, you can do that if you just want a clarification or if you truly want something that's an amendment that's different than what the motion maker of the motion wanted, then you can ask, then you can uh, try to amend the motion. Commissioner thank Young. You. Yes, thank you. Um, Vera, I have a question on a motion to continue uh, mm -hmm. and a motion to table. Are, are those the same or different? Could you explain that? I believe that they're actually different. A motion to table is usually suspending consideration of the item altogether, like we are done with it, right? You're just tabling the discussion. It is not coming back. That is never gonna happen with planning commission because you have a duty to either make recommendations to the council or adjudicate permit decisions in front of you. And there are timelines on some of those as well. And so you are never going to be tabling anything unless somebody says something like, why don't we have a study session on such and such a date? And they would kind of like, you know what, we're not ready for this. Let's just table it and bring it back at some future date. If you, whenever you decide, you know, something like that, but it's basically killing it off. Is my understanding of tabling. And a motion to continue then is to, um, uh, consider the item at a future meeting? Yes. And it's a little bit different than a deferral. Um, you know, on the planning commission agenda, we have the deferral item, which is usually right below public comment. You know, we've got roll call public comment and then deferral. And the deferrals are usually something that either the applicant or staff is asking for to defer. So you're not even opening the public hearing, right? You're just automatically saying, 
we're going to put it on a different date. We're not even going to take public comment here. When you continue a meeting, when you excuse me, continue an item on the agenda, you are generally already taking some information on it, and then you're running out of time and continuing it, or you're continuing it for additional information, or you're continuing it for whatever reason it might be. But you've already begun the hearing on it is generally a continuance. Thank you, Commissioner Young. Are there any more questions? I know it is 2.30. We had a break scheduled at 2.30, and Vera has been going. So go ahead, Vera. Uh, you were going to say something? It, no, do you want me to go on to item number four? Well, I can you know, probably get through it. Yeah. I was actually Let's going to say, to if, if, if you feel you, you want to just knock it out now, fine. I also don't mind giving you the 10, 15 minute break uh, because you have been going quite intensely on this. I'm, I'm okay with knocking it out. And I noticed we have a lot of time for public comment at the end, which we can probably, you know, uh, which I think we're not going to use that up given the a number of members of the public that are here. So if you don't mind, I'll knock through it and okay. we can do, yeah, thank you. I appreciate well, that. Of course. So um, the next, and so the next uh, item for item number four is um, I highlighted, let me see here. This is the wrong council policy. I'm just going to get to that. I am missing something here. Just a moment. You know what, Jennifer, hang on. I'm just going to go with what you have on the screen right now. Okay. I was asked to discuss the how commissioners can communicate with the public and can communicate with applicants. And um, there are limitations in the city council policy policies that have to do with public communication. The most important of those are, I should say, and these are repeated throughout several different council policies, um, are these ones that I've highlighted in policy 0-4. And what they basically, again, the biggest concept here to remember is that you have a duty to provide due process to applicants and the public who come before you, and that you have a duty of fairness. And so in your communications, if the communications occur outside of the public hearing process before the planning commission, they can be problematic. And so these kind of, this kind of gives you the parameters of what you can do and can't do. And um, the first highlighted item is A1 in section four of the code of conduct in, in policy 0-4. It basically says all commissioners should conduct meetings in a dignified and courteous manner. No bias or prejudice against any individual or group of people should be manifested by the commission, by any commissioner or condoned by any commission. And that is just a very overall due process, no conflict of interest, no bias rule. Um, Jennifer, can we move on to the next highlighted portion? And I'm sorry, I'm working off of my phone right now because of it. So I've highlighted the prohibitions on the use of various things. Um, you, know, you know, you're obviously given business cards, you're given email, um, a number of ways that people can contact you. And the commission basically is charged with making recommendations and decisions as a whole body. And you can't be subject to undue influence by council liaisons. I'm taking a look at subsection H here, city staff or any outside agency. And I know some of you have had questions about pressure that you feel because you've been appointed by a certain council district by whatever, by whoever, um, and that you were also contacted by members by people in your district, by people that you know, by applicants. And the bottom line is you can listen, but you do not base your decision on pressures that you receive from those people. And that is, that is the most important thing to remember. I'm gonna move on to the N here which says all conflicts of interest and circumstances giving rise to a perceived conflict of interest. So notice it says perceived, not actual, should be avoided. Commissioners must avoid the appearance of favoritism toward people and organizations with whom a commissioner is aff affiliated. For example, if a commissioner serves as a volunteer board member for a service organization, the commissioner must not vote on any matter which will directly affect that organization. 
I'm going to actually take that a little bit further. One of the questions that we were asked, for example, is people are contacting me, whatever, what can I say, what can't I say, what not. We said in the previous presentation that when you have contact from someone and you receive information from someone on matters that are on the agenda, you are required, and, and you'll see this later on in the policy, you're required to state who you spoke to on, when the agenda item comes up for decision, who you spoke to, and what the nature of the conversation or the information provided to you was. And so that the entire commission knows the same thing that you know. It gets the same information that you received. Uh, can we move on to the next yellow portion here? Okay. Commissioners are not to con uh, contact consultants or others under contract with the city directly outside of commission meetings unless they're authorized by the city administration. That, of course, is not true with city staff. If you have questions, we encourage you to ask city staff those questions so that we can respond to the entire commission and answer your question before the entire commission. We do that. And there's another important one here, subsection G. Commissioners shall not act as mediators or facilitators between the parties on matters that come before them. Any facilitation must be part of the public process and as requested or required by the city council. Planning commission is never really a facilitator between parties, but it's very important that you're not out in the public or not out with an applicant in the public attempting to put, fix a situation. Um, that's not your role. And um, it, that would lead to when a decision is, when you're being asked to make a decision that places you in a very awkward position because you may have been taking sides, you may have expressed your opinions about a particular project that, that, that later can basically arise to a conflict of interest that is biased. And, and people could probably prove that from uh, meetings that they have had with you in conversations. And for number two here, you are a quasi-judicial commission. You act as, as sort of a judge of the, the items that come before you. And it says commissions which sit as hearing bodies, which you are, and take administrative actions, including the planning commission, must be diligent to ensure that a hearing is fair and impartial. Commissioners should not have ex party communications with anyone on the subject outside of the hearing. And that ex party means without all parties present, without being in the hearing context. So that literally is a prohib prohibition here. And this is where it says, if you have a communication with a party or a party's representative regarding the subject matter, facts or issues of an administrative action pending before the commission, the communication shall be disclosed on the record of the administrative action or proceeding before the action is heard. So at the outset, you need to, when the item is heard, you need to state who you spoke to and what the nature of the communication was. It also says any visit to the site or other information gained outside of the hearing must be stated on the record and commissioners must disqualify themselves if there's any appearance of bias. And notice it doesn't say actual bias, it says appearance of bias. And we have rendered a lot of advice on this um, in the past. It also says that you are not to make any public comment on a matter pending before the commission until after the commission has rendered a decision. And even afterwards, it not, may not be very wise to do either. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> but that, that's up to you. But, but these are this number two for quasi-judicial commissions is the absolute rule for how you're to conduct your communications with applicants and members of the public. Um, can we move on to the next item? Thank you. I am not going to get into this policy in any detail because it repeats a lot of what was said in 0-4. Um, and so I'm not going to get into this 0-15 policy, but I put it there in case you wanna peruse it because the three policies that I did attach to the 0-4, 0-15, and 0-36 all deal with conduct of public officials and commissioners um, as public officials. And so I wanted to highlight those. Um, and then if we can go on to the next policy, 0-36, this policy is almost verbatim of what we went over in policy-0-4. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, but what this policy does on the first page and purpose is it really, it states that the city boards and commissions are formed in order to provide independent recommendations to the council or in the context of quasi judicial boards, such as the planning commission to make independent decisions and take administrative actions. Um, the quasi judicial actions, the commissions play an important role in being visible in the community and bringing broad representation of ideas into the process. But again, subject to those council rules of, of, of having your determinations of all of the evidence and all of the information that you receive to make a decision being in the hearing process, in the public hearing process, not behind closed doors, not on the telephone with someone, but in that public hearing process as a body. And so the intent of the policy is to formalize the need for independent advice and decision making by the commissions and to give a clear understanding of the roles. And when you go, um, you know, and they basically say that communications to the council also are through the council liaison. And so the council liaison is, is um, council member Imanes. And that, you know, and he usually, he has appeared at these, at these um, retreats previously. I don't know if he was invited by planning this year or whatever, but he has appeared previously. So if there are any, any concerns that the commission has or commissioner has, then we basically go through um, and, and they want them expressed to the council, we go through the council liaison. And it goes through the liaison um, interaction here. And then I wanna point out um, subsection D, which is on page two, it begins on page two of this policy. This is basically a synthesis of what we just went over in policy 0-4. I believe it's verbatim the same. So I just wanted to point this out because um, it appears in, it's important enough to appear in several council policies. And it also has the special under subsection E, which is on page four, uh, the last page, it also has the um, same rules that apply to quasi-judicial uh, commissions like the Planning Commission that we went over previously in policy uh, number 0-4. And what I was gonna mention to you as a practical matter, when you get emails uh, with information um, that are on a matter coming up before the commission or that you have a pretty good idea that are coming up before the commission, please forward those to Jennifer Provador and to Robert Manford. And if there are issues that city staff need to take care of uh, to respond, they will forward them to the staff member who can do that, who, whose project that is. And they will also make certain that when that those communications come up before um, the, the, when the item comes up before the commission, that those communications are included as public comment to the commission. How I suggest that you respond to phone calls and emails and any other communication, texts, whatever it may be regarding city business, asking you to vote because you know when you speak to people, if you're anything like anybody else on a commission, people are gonna say, can I count on your support? Can I do this? You know, can I, can I get you to commit to something? The answer is you can't commit to anything until you've heard um, the entire, the, and, you know, all, all of the people speak and all of the information to be given at the hearing. And that's really what the response is. Thank you, I'll consider what you have to say, but I need to hear everything when it comes before the commission, right? Because that is the unbiased manner of looking at it. And in all honesty, I may, you know, I personally have opinions and so do you. You may be swayed a certain way or another in looking at a project. And then when you hear the other side at a commission meeting or you hear other people's concern, your mind changes and that's legitimate. Leave yourself open to that. That's what the law requires. It requires you to be open and fair and hear what people have to say and the evidence that they present at hearing. So please do not commit yourself to any course of action before the public hearing is closed and, and you make your decision there. And so um, when you're speaking to people individually or as a group, um, you know, as a, uh, on something coming before you on a land use item, um, don't commit yourself to a course of action. 
and tell them to show up, encourage them to show up at the hearing, encourage them to write down their opinion, encourage them to give everybody on the commission that information in the hearing format. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and um, that's my advice to you. The other piece of advice also is that you really, really want to avoid seriatim meetings. So if you have an applicant, for example, or a member of the public from some organization that is for or against a project, whatever it is, they may come to you and give you certain information. They may also go to other members of the planning commission. And if any of the planning commissioners begin speaking to each other and you think you've only spoken to one person, you can't control the actions of others. And it may be that you end up with six people, a quorum of the commission, hearing information and discussing it in series. You know, kind of like a tele the game of telephone or something. Um, discussing it, you know, Commissioner A talks to Commissioner B. Commissioner B then talks to Commissioners C and D, you know, kind of counting on his hands, okay, I've only talked to three other people. And then Commissioner C talks to a couple of others you have a seriatim violation of the Brown Act. And so I want you to be very, very careful about not speaking to each other about items that are coming up before the planning commission or that would come up because of the nature of the project and also being careful about how you respond to people. Did anybody have any questions about that? Because I know that's very problematic for you in practice. All right, seeing none. Vera, thank you so much for that thorough uh, analysis of both uh, the new rules uh, of, of not Roberts, but Rothenberg rules and uh, and the uh, interactions amongst ourselves and the community and staff. Uh, as always, thank you for your due diligence and thank you for always uh, being there when we need the help. Uh, so with that, going one more time, any questions? Okay, seeing none, Barrett. You're very thank welcome. You. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. So with that, we will now go to the break. And as I stated earlier for the second half, Vice Chair Casey will be managing the meeting. So don't have too much fun without me. If so, I will look the video and see if you did. Uh, but enjoy your weekends. And thank you so much to staff and everyone else for coming together and uh, wishing you a very good second half of this retreat. So just to be clear, we're, we're coming back in 15? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you, sir.
Yes, please. Straight on. And we still have quorum. All right. I'll let you take the floor, Rob. Uh, we're going to introduce Nancy Klein and her group. Sure. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, so at this point, we're going to call Nancy Klein from our Office of Economic Development and her group to give us a presentation on uh, our discussion of the retail commercial development. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Nancy Klein, again, Director of Economic Development, and I'm here today with Nathan Donato Weinstein, who's going to be actually sharing slides, and then uh, Nathan and I can both answer some questions. Um, I really appreciate getting to spend a bit of time with you in this small group format. I think there's a lot of um, mutual passions uh, of items that are really and topics that are really important to us, Nathan and I both, things that you care a great deal about, business and neighborhoods and small business and um, vital places, and, and we want to very much be in communication to hear what you're thinking and um, be able to share uh, conversation back and forth. One thing I, I have to mention though, for just a second, you know, part of the delight of working with Chris is of course what he says, he's a very substantive guy, but it's also how he says it, right? And most Britishisms um, that he shares end up sharing light, but some were a little quirky. Like Chris said, he fell out of college. Some of you might have thought he didn't graduate college, but I know he did because I've seen his resume um, and worked with him a long time. Um, but there's just one of those very beloved Britishisms. Um, and also just wanted to mention that uh, when Chris was with planning, uh, he was a darn good planner. He got the issues, he got the big picture, he got the details, and he got a tremendous amount done. In, in, in as little time as possible. So I, I just wanna put in a plug for his work prior in planning and everything he's done and why he's a great choice for PBCE director. Um, what I really wanted to be able to do was just talk a little bit about um, OED, OCA, Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And um, then if you have thoughts about that, questions, um, we great to get to talk to you, and then I'll turn it over to Nathan. So Office of Economic Development had a name change this year, which was super intentional, and that is Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And um, our uh, Office of Cultural Affairs is one of the elements of economic development it had come to economic development after being in several different places, parks. Uh, anyway, it was it, it, over the years, it, it got moved around. And frankly, no one not, knew what to do with it. And, and Kim Wallace and I said, we'll take it. Um, we get that that is a huge part of economic development is arts and culture. And in the past year, there's no more important time than coming trying to come out of COVID, certainly being in COVID, then the focus on arts and culture of one, the artists who are small business, who are greatly impacted, and a lot of them are people of color. Uh, and secondly, the impact of reflecting culture, our resilience and our struggle, uh, all at the same time. Um, and why not a little controversy like holding the moment out at the airport, right? Whatever you thought of that. So um, we're very pleased to make that name change. And for us, it's in very, very intentional. And you'll see more work that highlights the, the arts and culture component of economic development. On the business development section, which is really 
um, the world Chris ran when he was with us in economic development and really is the heart of economic development. And to just name a few things, uh, development facilitation, uh, we work very closely, as many of you already know, um, making sure that we're supporting city staff, uh, planning department and the development services team, and also hoping to move things through a little more smoothly when sometimes there may be uh, extra time or somewhat uh, disagreement in different um whatever I want to say, in the different priorities that, that we have, because we have so many competing priorities at the city, and I know you know, all know that. And within uh, BizDev, there's also business attraction and retention. It's really important for our role to go out and look for great retail, great office development, great manufacturing, um, and, and even more important to keep who we have. So being in relationship with them, knowing what they need, um, trying to make work and employment uh, and contributions to community at least a little bit smoother. Then we also do a tremendous amount of policy work. Chris certainly furthered that on many fronts, uh, development free fee framework, commercial linkage fee, uh, North San Jose policy, and many more that will continue to work closely with development services partners. Then um, data, we provide, and Nathan is certainly part of that, research and provide a lot of data, um, especially to the city, the budget office, the planning department, and it informs our work. And then very much in this year, really year and a half, a little bit more now, we had focused so much on large business um, and retail, uh, and we don't have a lot of staff. I won't whine at you about that, but we're a small but mighty people, as you already know from planning. But we pivoted almost 100% to supporting small business in San Jose, the, the recovery team, first the emergency management team, um, really understanding the terrible struggles that small business owners and their families and their workers uh, we're having and how to work to get them information or get them resources. So that that was a tremendous amount of work and is a major focus for our work overall in the department. Office of Cultural Affairs, as I mentioned, they have uh, arts, uh, which public art and working with private folks for art, uh, working um, with festivals and events, city dance, if any of you joined us out there, they give a tremendous number of grants and that's a huge workspace all on its own. So there's quite a bit of work there. I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with Work to Future, which is our um, training and employment arm. We serve nine cities, not just the city of San Jose, and working to develop partnerships uh, like apprenticeship programs, um, really focusing on sectors, health, manufacturing, um, several others, but the, the focus on those sectors because they're growing and because they pay above minimum wage, and they pay benefits. So, uh, and there are career ladders. So there's a tremendous amount of work and work to future. Um, Jeff, Jeff Ruster uh, runs that shop and he's quite good. Um, and then real estate um, is a small, again, a small team within our team, but we buy and sell and work with public works on any of the vacation and or other um, public works transactions, and then work on um, the, the projects that are in city right of way. And, and, you know, that team works exceedingly well. We'll, we'll have gotten through um, Measure T, uh, uh, site securing the sites in record time, which is really important for our public safety folks. We'll have sold surplus land. We've been finding the housing department, most of their sites for um, EI, uh, emergency interim housing, et cetera. And then of course we have a, a mighty, but again, small administrative um, division, which helps the rest, keeps us in shape, whips us in shape. So with that, I'll just pause for a second, see if there are any 
questions you might have at all and also just say um you know always going through robert that's your main point of contact and we love to work i love to work with robert but then again if that works robert can always give you over to me and i'm happy to answer or help in any way possible as our team is uh up for that as well any vice chair casey anything or any of the members i don't see any hands okay well with that let me introduce nathan donato weinstein and and one of the things I want to just quickly mention uh, about Nathan, because this is an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. Nathan, I don't know how many of you read the business journal, but before Nathan came to us from the business journal, there he was a, he is an excellent writer. And there was nobody who scooped stories like Nathan scoops stories. So we are so lucky to have his critical thinking, fast acting, and very affable self. And so Nathan Denar Weinstein. Wow. Nancy, oh my gosh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, and thank you, Vice Chair Casey and um, all the commissioners for having us today. It's awesome to see you. Um, am I sharing my screen successfully? Yes. Yes. I am. Am I? Okay. Um, our next connection stays stable. Um, yeah, so you might need to turn off your, for because you are cutting out a little bit, Nate. Okay. Here we go. Let's try that. Um, okay. Um, so what we thought we would do today is uh, take a little bit of a deep dive together into our um, ecosystem of retail and what we might more broadly call the ground floor commercial space. Um, so we've seen a lot of evolution of this over the last 10 years, uh, as you as you know. Um, and so uh, we'd like to just gain a better understanding uh, through this discussion of where we're at and where we're going um, in this real estate sector, uh, which is so important for our neighborhoods uh, and our city, uh, so that we can also understand kind of how new development comes into play um, and also affects the city's commercial ecosystem. Um, so these are some goals uh, for, for our, our talk today. Um, but let's kick off with us by getting a glimpse of the broad landscape uh, right now for what we are gonna call a ground floor commercial space, um, which we can think of as referring to things like shops, restaurants, personal services, small offices, and, and so on. Um, but first, I wanna caveat this uh, by saying, um, uh, Am I okay? I'm good. My internet connection is still good. Okay, awesome. Um, the caveat is take retail vacancy numbers like this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, they probably don't reflect what's going on um, in your neighborhood. And when I talked with some retail brokers this week to verify these official numbers, they told me they, they think our retail vacancy rate is more around 7%. Um, but the, the point is, uh, we really have not seen a complete collapse of our uh, of our retail sector in recent years, and, and even um, during COVID. Um, in fact, we've actually seen pretty good absorption of higher quality retail, what we call box space, even during the pandemic. But one area that has struggled uh, more than others is the category of what we call street retail or the commercial corridor retail, um, especially in our more vulnerable communities. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but also want to think about what is filling retail space today? What is it? What does that term mean? Well, it's different now. Um, and much of our retail activity uh, and tenancy now is all about food, fitness, medical services even is a growing sector, personal services, um, really outside of mall or department discount uh, stores, it's not so much the apparel, record store, shoes, and th those sorts of things. And, and that's no surprise, right? We've been seeing that 
over the last, um, you know, more than a decade, really. Also, just want to spend a moment on this uh, notion of retail and the connection to sales tax. Um, so when we think of retail, we often think of sales tax, and for good reason. Sales tax is the general, uh, the general fund's second largest source of revenue, and a lot of it comes from general, what we call general retail. Um, but retail isn't the only contributor to our sales tax revenue. You also have sectors like construction, business to business sales, transportation um, and food products outside of a retail setting. Um, so while, while retail is, is critical, it's not the only thing. Um, but what's important to our discussion today and to keep in mind generally is that sales tax tends to be concentrated within categories. Um, so our top 25 sales taxpayers are identified here on, on this slide. And together, they account for about 30 um, percent of the city's sales tax. Um, and also keep in mind, many forms of what we think of as retail tenants don't produce much sales tax at all. In fact, most types of personal services or health and wellness types of services are not gonna produce sales tax. And that's just fine uh, because we think those uses are super important and great um, because of the impact they have on our, on our neighborhoods um, and, and jobs, right? So let's take a minute and, and just think about our retail base in a little more depth um, really quick. So there's about 36 million square feet of this stuff in San Jose, and you can segment it into a bunch of categories, each of which serves a different role and supports a different type of tenant. Um, so let's do a quick overview here. When we think of um, retail, we often think of street retail, like this stretch of Alum Rock, um, where it's really a mix of offices, services, traditional retail restaurants, usually in a standalone format that faces the street, um, and you might have parking in the back. Th these are areas like 13th Street, Lincoln Avenue, Japantown, really heavy with mom and pop and independent business types of um, types of, of entrepreneurs, and we tend to be protective of them. Then you have your neighborhood centers uh, where you might have a grocery store and perhaps a drugstore with inline shops. These make up about 12% of the city's retail base, and they usually serve a specific neighborhood with residents that make multiple trips uh, per week. These tend to be the strongest types of retail properties in our current environment from a financial perspective. Um, your strip centers, we all know and love these. These lack an anchor store. They serve the immediate area. A um, lot of small, uh, small tenants and daily needs. Um, and then our big box tenants in power centers, like, uh, like the plant, which I'm showing here. This accounts actually for a plurality of our retail sales taxes. And they're located on major traffic corridors because they're uh, seeking to attract a regional customer base. Um, and of course, our malls, which continue to evolve in response to changes in the industry. Um, and, you know, the reason I wanted to show these uh, is because we're really not expecting to build a whole lot more st uh, additional standalone retail in the types of formats I just showed you. Um, instead, what we expect much of our future commercial space to look like is something more like, like these projects here, um, what we often call mixed use. Um, where you, you know, you may have uh, retail commercial space on the bottom floor and residential or office above. Um, and we, we tend to think of this as being like a new thing, but of course it's not. It's a very traditional development typology. But, you know, it fell out of favor for decades as suburbanization took hold um, in America. And um, we kept uses really separate from each other. But the city's general plan does prioritize inclusion of commercial space in new structures like these for a number of reasons. Um, and let's take a quick look at that. So, um, you know, all these reasons we, we know about that make a lot of sense in a lot of places. Um, we wanna provide services that are nearby to residents, um, create the ability to internalize some of those car trips. Um, and also, you know, contribute to placemaking, um, which you, you know, we, we can do through those commercial services a lot of times and create gathering places for residents. Um, and I put, 
potential for city revenue sort of on the bottom with an asterisk just to call attention to the previous slide that you know it's it's not the only reason why we care about commercial space and, and quite a lot of times it, it doesn't come into play at all um and then also just kind of wanted to underline this idea that you know, commercial doesn't have to be retail. The ground floor does not have to necessarily be a, a retail use, could be an office use. Um, and keeping in mind, a lot of these areas that we're targeting for growth in this context, this mixed use context, often include existing commercial, whether it's strip centers or, or light industrial um, sites, um, where this growth is planned, right? And so we're gonna talk a little bit about Kind of what happens then um, when those sites get redeveloped and what happens to those businesses um and also wanted to highlight you know although it has a long history this this development type um as the city and and really our uh, our country rediscovered this um, development type um, early implementations of mixed use often didn't quite work quite well enough um, because of uh, inadequacies and in some of the infrastructure uh, that made it less adequate for certain tenant types, but we do continue to get better at that. Um, so really quick, let's just flash through some examples. We're gonna show you sort of the good and the bad here um, of some uh, mixed use spaces, looking at that first floor. Um, the first is a new downtown project called Modera. You may have walked by recently. Um, what I thought was interesting about th this one, um, but this is on a former uh, parking lot uh, in San Pedro Square area, um, is that it actually attracted a uh, medical clinic called Carbon Health that is a growing um, uh, a growing health network. And they really identified a lack in the market of medical services in downtown um, and uh, kind of found the right spot for them here. And, and that's um, some sort of a new, a little bit of a new trend. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see, um, you know, if that continues. Um, Quetzal Gardens is a really beautiful, affordable project that's reaching completion very soon out in the Alum Rock corridor. Um, and this is an example where you have a mission-driven project um, that forms an alliance with a mission-driven um, ground floor tenant, actually a couple of them, um, Excite Credit Union, uh, which has re recently become a community development financial institution, is dedicated towards um, uh, lending um, in underserved areas, and they were looking for a location, and this was perfect for them. Um, this ground floor space will also include um, the headquarters for the Somos Mayfair organization and a small business center in partnership with the Latino Business Foundation. So this is like a really creative example of something we'd like to see a lot more of um, in San Jose. Here's a project that's not in San Jose, um, but uh, what we found is you can do things like grocery stores in a mixed use context. Um, and here's an example of that in Santa Clara. Um, what I think is interesting about this one is um, it has surface parking. And actually in San Jose, we do have a grocery store in a new mixed use building. It's the news newish. Zanatos over off of Southwest Expressway, and it also has a little bit of a surface parking lot. And we're going to talk about why that's relevant um, in a minute. Um, and then sometimes these projects can struggle to fill that ground floor space. And, um, and this is an example. This is a very cool, very dense project on North First Street that has just a little bit of commercial space on the ground floor. Um, and they've actually been working really hard to get it leased, but they haven't been able to fill it. And what we hear time and again is this project was actually built without any parking um, for the retail slash commercial. And you know the thinking at the time was that great, you won't need it. There's a light rail stop across the street and you've got all these residents above, but what actually turned out is the tenants do want it. They wanna see it, they wanna have access to it. Um, and so this is not an example where the property owner is just not trying, they actually are trying really hard. Um, they just haven't been able to find a tenant that can live without parking. Uh, 
So on this theme of some of these challenges around that ground floor space in these new mixed use buildings, um, there's a lot. Um, one of the biggest is that parking issue, um, structured parking, um, which many of these projects have, is just something that a lot of our retail tenants are not interested in, in doing. Um, and that, you know, that's because this has been for so long a, a suburban context and consumer habits uh, you know, are really ingrained. Um, there can also be challenges around the, uh, you know, the structure of the building and the appropriateness for restaurants, which is a huge part of the retail environment these days. As we know, you know is it set up with the right venting and grease traps? Um, the early days, these buildings really struggled with that, but they have gotten better. Um, and then costs. This isn't unique to this type of building, um, but often uh, it, it, it's a struggle with these because you're improving them from what's known as a cold shell or sort of the least finished um, type of space. Um, and because they are new buildings, um, your what we call triple net costs, which are those you know, utilities, um, property tax pass-throughs can be higher for these. And so that can add on to that sticker cost of, of your rent. Um, and that can, because of that, because of this whole dynamic, that can change the mix of who's attracted to these projects. And you can start to get a little bit more of a, you know, who can pay this kind of rent and costs, more of your chain type tenants um, and that, you know, that may or may not be desirable. Um, and then you have the flip side, and this is what I kind of hinted at a few minutes ago. Um, tenants that have to relocate because their, their site, their strip center or their, their um, commercial corridor is, uh, uh, you know, going to be landing one of these new projects. They, um, they often struggle to successfully relocate. Um, and their challenges are often magnified as they encounter a marketplace that is likely much more expensive and competitive than when they were last searching um, for that space. Um, and again, they may get uh, a sticker shock um, from some of those, uh, those, not just the lease costs and those um, you know, triple net costs, but simply how hard it is to find a suitable space. And it's not just retail tenants, right? Uh, a lot of our um, projects are redeveloping existing light industrial or our, our sort of flex space, what we call flex space. Um, this sign is a sign for a project that recently had a uh, redevelopment approved. And, you know, we're going to lose a lot of these companies. And, and one of them um, is, is leaving the city. Um, and the reason why this is important um, as well is because a lot of these businesses are sort of our secret sauce in Silicon Valley. Uh, a lot of these, you know, small manufacturers or machine shops do work for big tech companies or innovative companies, um, and and we, you know, we lose something when we lose them, right? Um, of course, a displaced business, sticking with this concept of these businesses that that struggle to relocate, um, they can be what we, you know, think of as long time culturally significant businesses. Um, and of course, many of our small businesses are, are disproportionately owned by uh, people of color and, and women. Um, but things can go well too uh, on this front. And so if you're into cars and wheels, you may know about Hubcap City, um, which is a super cool business that's been in, this, in San Jose since the 80s. Um, and this is an example of a successful relocation where things came together for this tenant um, and what was key for them um, as their site was being targeted for redevelopment into a Marriott um, that you can see there is was really early notification um, and the landlord being really flexible with sort of the, the process for them to move out, even allowing them to sort of um, uh, store some of their stuff on site while they were transitioning um, out after they had to, had to leave. Um, so this 
this presentation is really not designed to be a presentation on small business displacement in depth. Um, in August, my colleague Vic uh, presented some of the latest thinking and insights on this subject. And so I would really encourage anyone interested in this to review that presentation. Um, the discussion centered on how business displacement occurs, how businesses can protect themselves and lessons learned from some recent analysis of the issue. And our department is actively working on this um, and we're still researching and understanding what is possible and, and effective. Um, the city uh, has undertaken a pilot study that focuses on the Alum Rock area where a number of projects are planned on sites that include existing businesses. Um, and it included a survey that provided us some important insights. And one of the most important was just a general lack of understanding of the development process among the small business owners in the area, their rights and responsibilities under a lease. Um, and you know, the reality is that local government has limited options to affect outcomes and that uh, tenant protections for businesses simply do not exist the way they do for residents. Um, and in general, the city cannot dictate the terms between a landlord and a tenant. But small business displacement is a growing area of interest all across the country. There's a new nationwide network uh, centered at the University of Maryland that is sharing information on strategies and resources. Some of these things can come from unlikely places. One example that uh, this institute has been working on is a voluntary code of conduct that a lender can actually build into a loan that spells out how existing tenants are treated or notified about plans for a site. Um, and these are just some of the things that we're thinking about. These are not recommendations, just some of the sort of subject areas and study areas that are on our radar um, around um, this, this issue, right? And uh, one of the most important, as I mentioned, um, is that notification or signposting function. Um, access to services and referrals for small business owners, but also let's not, uh, you know, neglect the importance of preserving a diverse supply of commercial and industrial property um, so that businesses have a place to go to when they learn, um, you know, that they have, have to move, right? Um, uh, otherwise, we will um, continue to lose some of these companies that are so important to us. Um, so, that's my spiel. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, for your attention today, and Nancy and I are um, happy and excited to discuss further with you. I guess we're opening the floor here to any commissioners that might have questions for either Nancy or Nathan. Commissioner Cantrell. Yeah, I'm just curious if um, if there's a state department at all that really helps to kind of help these businesses, especially the small, more legacy businesses, uh, relocate? Is there anything that we do to help them survive this, this development crash? I, I ask this because as, as we do our jobs, and I know that none of us want to see any small businesses harmed uh, through development, but I, I think it happens a lot. Uh, and, my, and my concern is that uh, we should do as much as we possibly can to keep that tax base in the city. It should not be a zero sum game. Nate, you want to start? I can. Sure. Yeah, because I get those calls a lot <laughs> of um, what are we going to do for this? In fact, I got one today um, from the mayor's office. So um, there are things we we can do. It's. I'll be frank with you. It's it's hard for us as a direct to provide direct services to. The, given the amount of need that's out there, because Commissioner Cantrell, you're right. It happens, it does happen a lot. Um, we try to help as much as we can. We're a staff of 10 and there's, you know, 60,000 plus small businesses in the, in the city. Um, we have, we, what we can do and what we do do is provide referrals to folks in the real estate industry who might be able to help. Um, we do property searches for folks using a pr uh, proprietary database that we subscribe to, and we refer people to f f low cost or no cost uh, small business assistance providers um, who can really work more intensively um, with the small business community. Um, so, you know, this is a growing area of our 
of our direct service delivery as well, but we can't do it all. Um, and we, we do really need to rely on our partners. One of the areas we're really trying to build up as we look into our work plan for next year is the local business association, because we recognize the um, most effective folks in this realm exist on the ground in na like affected neighborhoods. Um, however, only a small number of the city's uh, commercial corridors have, you know, formal and effective business associations. And so we're working um, with our partners to um, look at growing that roster um, and kind of, you know, adding force multipliers out there that can um, do this work, you know, five, seven days a week. And I just want to add a couple things to that. So uh, part of what Nathan said was working with uh, the organizations that provide technical assistance. <clears throat> and those are really critical. Being able to have access to no cost legal services, brokerage services, finance services, marketing services, so that businesses can take advantage of those services um, to help them be stronger. Then they're more resilient. They have options. So looking at small business resiliency is something that's really important. Um, Nathan went through the Quetzal Gardens uh, project, which will have the, the business, uh, uh, small business um, uh, incubator. And Again, that's an area to focus on for the small businesses, particularly on the east side. And during the course of the pandemic, uh, Nathan, working with Chris, uh, wrote and received a, a economic development uh, administrative administration grant, and those dollars are being also leveraged with ARC, um, American Rescue Plan dollars. And the idea is to focus those dollars on training the trainer, on getting skills, because those folks absolutely know their neighbors and their constituents best. One of the things that our office is um, pursuing, working uh, to develop um, a community development corporation, a CDC, some of those you might have heard of, um, and it, <laughs> San Jose doesn't have one yet. And that is something that um, other, many other cities our size do. So looking at how we can do that, bridge that gap. Um, Nathan also mentioned business associations and neighborhood business districts. Part of that is getting the city to um, focus and allow dollars, because you really need staffing in each of those areas to support and continuity. Many of our business districts um, because they're running their own business, it, it's hard to, for them to build up to a time that there's efficient uh, leadership with a president or vice president or other members of the business association to, till they gear up. It's, it's not necessarily an easy thing. So to have resource to help that get done um, is, is a really important investment. So I think um, there has been a tremendous amount. We'd be happy to send the chair and vice chair or Robert, to you if you prefer, um, a summary of the work that Office of Economic Development did um, in order to get grants for um, small businesses in San Jose, uh, and that was substantial. And of the grants that we controlled, more than 90% went to people of color in the zip codes where there was the most impact. So, so the office has been, um, really dedicated and had some great results. And by all means, we know um, we have much more work to do. Really excited about things that are happening like Excite, the, the, um, uh, the credit union. Credit union, <laughs> thank you. I was just coming up with union, sorry, Nathan. Um, and, and they've now become a CDFI a community development finance institute, and they are helping uh, with the financing for the Quetzal project. And we're already talking to them about other potential projects that they may get involved in. So it is that strength of resource that can help. Just one 
further comment. Actually, uh, I noted the example of Hub, Hubcap City, uh, which is in my community. And, and you know, as I reviewed that project, uh, was my concern, that, well, what's going to happen here? Uh, and I think that's a oh, great wow. example of when a good uh, landlord um, actually treats their customers with dignity and respect and help them, uh, how everybody can win. And in that case, everybody won. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did that a building that was an eyesore get some improvements, uh, yeah, we'll get a nice new location, a nice new hotel nearby and things like that. But I, I think there's got to be more we can do to compel landowners and developers to do the right thing because it helps the entire community. There should not be victims of development. That just seems perverse. But thank you very much for, for your help, I, for your talk. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Young, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Nancy and Nathan, thank you for the presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, I've learned a lot um, and really appreciate it. My question is on the jobs, housing imbalance in the city. Um, I believe we're the only major city that has a daytime population that's lower than our nighttime population and really, really important for the city, for the budget and other reasons to attract more jobs to the city. Um, at the same time as we need a lot more housing in the city. So just wondering what strategies you all are using to uh, try to attract more job rich tenants into the city. Nathan, do you mind if I start? Go for it. So th this is a both and situation and we're looking to support innovation, both in housing development of housing and particularly in how financing is approached for housing and also for jobs so part of that strategy which um, you know is something that we'll talk about together as projects come forward is making sure we don't convert industrial and commercial land either more than we have or at least without a really hard look at it so we need jobs and you all, we would love to come back um, and, and look at the numbers because there's no one right way to look at the numbers. We, we very much know that. But the, the jobs land in San Jose is shrinking. We're now with the coyote um, transfer, which believe me, real estate was in the thick of, but we're about 12% of San Jose's land is dedicated for jobs. I'm talking about any kind of jobs, it's 12%. And everything else is parks, or most of it is actually, you know, single family homes um, and roadway, et cetera. Um, so uh, we preciously have to really think about what is the use on those lands and try to make sure they're available for jobs. I think, um, you know, Chris, um, this, uh, still a transition period for me. I was so used to working with Chris on a day to day on so many things. Um, but manufacturing is one of those really first loves because um, almost a quarter of our jobs touch in San Jose about 430,000 jobs, and almost a quarter of them, 90 some odd thousand, um, are still related to manufacturing. We, we make things here in San Jose, it's, it's, it's terribly cool. Um, and that jobs that are manufacturing in nature, I know you know this, but just to make it plain, they pay above average wages and they have benefits and they have career ladders. So those can be, if we can make that bridge between workforce and housing, then um, that can be generational wealth change, which is really what we want to see. Um, and then the other thing that's a, 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 of a particular note, Commissioner, um, is working with housing and planning. We really want to embed one of the innovations that we hope to embed in San Jose is that we never talk about affordable housing by itself, that we always talk about affordable housing and jobs, that they're one to bound with the other together. Because not, that's not the case for everybody. I, I, I get it. There are some cases we can't imagine necessarily everybody in affordable housing is going to go
go to work within a year, but that is something we can do more in and just on a humanitarian level as well as work level. So we spend a lot of time, less time in this year, but a lot of times with Work to Future and uh, Nathan and Chris's former shop, the business development, business retention, uh, in looking at healthcare, looking at um, um, manufacturing, looking at several of the other clusters that are growth oriented. IT, of course, um, you know, a number of people say to us, we need to have brown engineers and we agree. So what are we doing in order to facilitate that? which also helps our tech companies. So, so there's a lot of targeted industry work and a lot of that is working with companies to make a bigger commitment than they have in the past. Because companies who are running their business will often say, well, you guys gotta do that or it's not our job. But hopefully, like Google is helping us in some regard there, um, it's time for a deeper rooted participation, including by job oriented companies. Nathan, what, what, what did I leave out there? <laughs> Nothing. I, well, I mean, I would say what else is important is to just have the capacity for additional job growth, right? And that's why North San Jose is so critical and why downtown is so critical in terms of, you know, those areas are, are primed for growth for both housing and, um, and jobs, um, you know, and then having, you know, we said in the Prezi, having sort of adequate supply of of like real estate stuff like different food groups for businesses because different folks need different strokes right and um you know we have edenvale for that type of company and we have um monterey corridor for those types of companies and you no know, yeah like our jobs picture isn't where it should be um from a jobs to residents ratio but we have something a lot of other cities don't, which is these options that are just, we have something for everyone in those neighborhoods. Okay. Commissioner Torrance. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I know we're running short on time here. So I just have a quick comment, kind of going back to what my colleague um, Kentrell, Commissioner Kentrell was saying about uh, small, small business questions and helping them. Um, I just wanted to mention the group Silicon Valley Small Business Development Center. I don't think that that one was mentioned. Um, I'm sure Nancy and Nathan are aware of it, but I just had personal anecdote. I reached out as a small business owner who just hired my first two employees and I was really struggling. I know, right? Um, knowing how to do payroll. I was, it was, it was so much more complicated than I thought. And so I was just Googling, I need help, I need help. And that group popped up and I reached out and they gave me free counseling and led me to someone to help with that. Oh, wow. And it worked it out. And now my employees are getting paid, streamlined. So that was huge, huge. Um, so I want more people to know about that. And the second thing is your group with the grants that you did, I also benefited as a female small business owner. Yay. Uh, getting one of those grants. So that's my shout out. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Commissioner Ornella's wise, you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask planning. How do you, I mean, obviously we, we, we hear what, uh, you know, Nathan and Nancy are saying in, in regards to concerns with these small businesses. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any conditions that you all put in place in regards to helping either re retain or relocate these small businesses when a big proposal like this comes up, you know, um, early outreach, I mean, how and when do you integrate that in the planning process? Um, that's just one of my um, questions. Another thing is um, I'm really excited about the fact that you have the cultural affairs uh, because I, I believe I'm also a local artist and will be performing at the Children's Discovery Museum and San Jose Museum of Art tomorrow for the other wow. commercials. So I know a lot of artists, local artists. And so um, I believe um, you could definitely beautify the city. And you know, you see all these vacant walls um, that I would like to see murals or, or different art pieces or commissions. I know that there was 
I see around the neighborhood that there was um, some paintings. I think it was like on some utility boxes around the city. Mm -hmm. And so I drive around and I see that and I think, oh, that that's wonderful. But I'd like to see that at a larger scale. I think because there's unfortunately such a huge homeless population there, I'd like to see, you know, just an immersion of, of art infused into the city to help beautify the city. And just because I know so many wonderful local artists and um, that could and would be happy to do so much things to help beautify the city. I, I'd really like to see that. And with some of the small business owners, I know um, just helping with um, safety um, of the people that either use the business and the people that that are the tenants there in regards to because of the trash, unfortunately, that I see now, like a sidewalk steam cleaning projects. Um, how are you like with these areas that are more concentrated with like homeless? I'd like to see some some of those tenants be helped more. Um, so those are just my comments. I I very excited to to see what you're doing and I look forward to 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 more things. So those are just my comments. Just a few things, if I might, and, and Nate or Chris, wherever you want to jump in, um, switch hitter there. Um, on business uh, and small business, um, we, as as Nathan reminded you, um, Vic Farley had come to you and, and presented work on small business displacement that was a, a pilot on Alum Rock. And we've been learning a lot from that. And one of the things we're, we're working on or trying to work toward is a small business displacement policy, which is something, of course, moving forward, we would um, work closely with planning and, of course, the attorneys, wherever Vera is. And um, we, we, we need to be really strategic and cautious, right, because we, we don't admittedly have a ton of money. To put into this, so we're we're doing the research to learn what other places uh, do, because certainly there are many other cities that that are dealing with this. As Nathan mentioned, time asking or demanding from um, developers that they give the businesses time, which is one of the things that's just key in order to to be resilient. You got to be able to deal with with the issues. And then um, access to services like legal services, like brokerage services, um, and have those be hopefully pro bono, if not really low cost. And they've got to be excellent, right? That we, 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 you know, they're there, I'll tell you, um, SCORE is a great thing. Society of Retired, in, um, um, and not engineers, but employers. And Sometimes it's a little hit or miss about who might be on the other end of that. And we need to really make sure that folks can give good help if they're going to get, you know, something, um, Commissioner Torrance, like a business who doesn't have a lot of time, you, you really want to know who you're reaching out to, has something valuable to offer. So, so on that level, um, it, you know, we have a, a housing anti-displacement policy. It's, it's time for a compendium to a small business displacement policy. Um, and, and then beyond that, love to off, offline um, introduce you to Michael Ogilvy, who's the um, public art director, and um, he, he's awesome. I want to make sure that if you can, if you put on your calendar November 5th, I believe it's 530, Sonic Runway. Uh, has been installed, reinstalled out in front of City Hall, and it'll be uh, November 5th is its, its official turn-on date, and it'll be with us for at least seven years. So they have re-engineered it. It's beautiful, installed, ADA compliant, um, and, and looking really good. So um, would love to, you know, again, I know your point of contact is Robert, and to the places where it makes sense for us to be able to answer other questions or introduce you to other resources, we'd, we'd very much like to do that. Thank you. Commissioner Dorans, follow up? Or? Follow up, quick thing, Sonic Runway, it's so amazing. And I'm wondering, Robert, I'd like to put a suggestion out there that next year our retreat we meet and we walk through the sonic runway. 
So I'm just putting that out there right now because I want to meet these people in person. I have not. <laughs> Noted. Noted. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have no more questions from the commissioners. I believe this is the public comment portion. And I think I see two in the uh, queue here. Am I right, Robert? Should thank we? Thank you for the time. Correct. I, oh, I like on behalf of the commissioners, I'd like to thank Nancy, uh, Nathan, Robert, I know Vera's gone, and Chris, it was really informative. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, I believe, is it Alex, Robert, that's first? Yes, Alex is first. And uh, Jennifer, can you unmute Alex? Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Vice Chair Casey. Before my time starts, is it acceptable to ask Nathan to go back to a slide in his presentation? And just, I wanted to build off something he was talking about. Is that a, an okay request? You're on the spot, Nathan. Can you? I got it. I'm, I'm getting there. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's DJ, the slide? DJ Nathan. Nathan, the slide I was hoping you to show again is the one that talks about the benefits of mixed use and ground floor activation, talks about placemaking. Oh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Cool. Uh, yeah. And while he's going to that, I, I just uh, want to thank Commissioner Cottrell for your comments about displacement and how we can find ways to keep businesses when new development happens. It's, it's something that uh, the work I do at Catalyze SV, when our members score projects, we frequently ask developers, like a project on West San Carlos, if they could bring back the pupuseria that uh, had been there for years or the Taqueria on Ray Street. So uh, those are very challenging conversations and I think it would be great to have the Planning Commission weigh in on those uh, from project to project or generally as you did today. Um, so appreciate that and also wanna thank Nathan and Nancy who are working with the Berryessa flea market vendors to try to support them. Uh, they are absolutely in jeopardy of being displaced from working and living in our community. And truth be told, we're asking the city to do even more to try to prevent that displacement. So um, thank you, Nancy and Nathan, your team for working on that. And that's a huge, huge concern here in our community that uh, we appreciate the Planning Commission continuing to look at. So on this uh, slide, I really appreciate all the benefits that I think Nathan absolutely wisely talked about when it comes to ground floor activation. I think there's another one here, which is something all of us intuitively experience when we walk on the street. If you can activate a neighborhood with more activity for more hours of the day, you can put what Jane Jacobs calls more eyes on the street, or what I call more good guys on the street than bad guys. And the more good guys on the street going into businesses uh, during different times of day from the 6 a.m. coffee shop to the 11 p.m bar closing, the more safe all of us feel in our communities. And so I think that's another benefit of ground floor activation that we want to think about. Um, I think another trend that we're starting to see at Catalyze SV and some of the developments we work on is that nonprofits or community rooms are also opportunities uh, for other ways to activate a space. And so that can be really, really beneficial to pre preventing some of that displacement. And Nathan presented that great example of Somos Mayfair showing up in Quetzal Gardens on Alum Rock Avenue. So having nonprofits be able to be in space is really great. Um, so I, I hope that's something you all can continue to think about and, and consider as you're going forward. The other thing I'd say is, you know, as the 10th largest city in the country, uh, we've got to continue to push for mixed use neighborhoods. They exist all across the country in large cities like ours. And I, I think of a neighborhood like Southeast DC. I used to live in DC 20 years ago and that city has changed a lot. And a neighborhood like Southeast has building after building after building, eight to 15 stories with active ground floors. So when developers tell you that that can't be done in San Jose, I would say it is being done in every city in America and it's done successfully and it is absolutely contributing to the improved quality of life in the community. So I hope that the city officials and 
planning commissioners and community members will continue to support mixed use development as a key to unlocking a better San Jose. Thanks for the time today, commissioners and staff. Thank you, Alex. Um, Robert or Jennifer, I think we've got Mike. Mike Sondergren. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for your service. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, commenting on behalf of Preservation Action Council uh, in a pretty broad context here, um, I specifically also want to note the comments by Commissioner Contrell about the, and, and I know it was a little bit of color, but you know, uh, we don't want victims of development. And I'm certain that everybody that's on the commission feels the same way. But unfortunately, what happens with too many of these projects is um, we hear the term from you know the new developers that um, it doesn't pencil out unless we get uh, the dropping of in lieu fees for affordable housing, or we have to ignore um, you know the goals that the city has, the general goals the city has for its cultural preservation, historic preservation, or parking or anything else, and. I just would challenge the commission and staff to work really, really hard to um, make sure that those things are not easily written off. Um, you know, uh, when we're seeking a new opportunity, because we have to think of the ones that are already here, the ones that are already busting their tail to uh, provide business. And uh, one of the things I think, just to uh, tag on the catalyst uh, comment, was um, you know for the for the tech industry, I come from the tech industry, and I'm telling you, if we lose those small businesses that Nathan pointed out that are the contributors, the machine shops and others, we will lose big tech. So thank you. I appreciate what you guys do, and I look forward to this next year. Thank you, Mike. Robert, I think that's a wrap, no? Okay, once again, I want to thank planning staff and all you folks for coming out and giving us a wonderful presentation. It was beautiful. Uh, enjoy your weekends. See you guys, I believe it's next Wednesday. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.